Sorry, Good afternoon, everyone. Is this okay? I want to uh, introduce from the professional standards section uh, Lieutenant Collette and uh, Sergeant Snow, uh, who uh, kindly consented to be here on this afternoon uh, to explain to us uh, uh, the process. Uh, uh, for going through a complaint mm -hmm. from the professional standards perspective. Um, what I would like to do is to go around the room and so that everyone can introduce themselves and say that where they're from because this is the Coalition for Police Reform. And uh, beginning with uh, this young lady. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kaylin. I am from the New York Civil Liberties Union. Hello. Hi, I'm Ted Forsyth. I'm with the group called Enough is Enough. Hi, I'm William Wilkinson. I'm president of Greater Rochester Community of Churches and the Coalition for Police Reform. I'm John Bell. I'm involved with Flying Squirrel. Okay. I'm Kerry Coleman. I'm UCLM. I'm for the uh, co-member of the Co Coalition for Police uh, Reform. Also, I'm the uh, chairman for the uh, civilian review process here that's coming up here. Also, I was instrumental in uh, the input with the body cameras for the RPD. Willie Smith, I'm the pastor of the Pentecostal Mingle Lives in the Church, uh, 5 George and Portland Avenue, and I'm a bank member with the Hi, I'm Mike Bleague. I'm both with the Race and Juvenile Criminal Justice Team, part of Free, and I've been with UCLM for a while. I'm Gail Mott with the Coalition. I'm also a member of the Interfaith Alliance of Rochester and this church. I'm Dave Sutlifadius, I'm with the Center for Disability Rights. I'm Alan Daly, and I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Greater Rochester Community of Churches. I'm also with UCLM, and I'm also the Interim Pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Rockport. I'm Matt Fusco, I'm an attorney. Um, several people know who are my clients. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you all for coming, and so uh, I'll turn it over in the hands of these gentlemen here, and then after their presentation, we'll open up for <coughs> Q&A. Thank you. Sounds good. I'm Lieutenant Kaleri. I'm the in charge and responsible for the professional standards section and the way that we conduct business. I was born and raised in the city of Rochester. I have a, a vested interest in the city and the success in the city. I have family in the city, and like I said, I, I was born there. I, I, I know it's in, it's an out, and I want it to be successful. One of the things that we learn in police, especially in the professional standards section, that the way we do our job effectively is by earning your trust. And we understand that that's the only way that we can able, we are able to do our job, is through your trust. And that's what is very important, that we maintain the integrity of the department and the process. And that's what we're here to explain to you today. Sergeant. Hi, I'm Sergeant Snow. Um, <clears throat> I was born in uh, Kings, Tree, Kings Tree, South Carolina, to an unwed mother. Uh, moved me to Rochester in the 70s, got married. Uh, grew up on Woodbury Street, went to Edison Tech, and graduated from Edison Tech. Junior year of uh, high school, I enrolled into the Army National Guard. Went through the Army National Guard in, after my junior year, went to basic training, came back, finished my senior year, and um, went off to uh, college. I went to Morehouse College because uh, back then Martin Luther King went there. Uh, Morehouse was ready, was ready for me. I wasn't ready for Morehouse. Uh, after uh, the first uh, you know, December, my father brought me back. and. Uh, that I needed to get a job or do something else because I, I was messing up his money. So, uh, you know, I mess, I cuddled around and then I always achieved my lifelong dream of becoming a, a police officer. Um, got married. Right now I go to church at uh, Genesee Baptist Church mm -hmm. uh, on 149 uh, Brooks Avenue. So, uh, I mean, I'm Right now, 22 years of a veteran of the police force. Uh, got made a sergeant 18 years after being on the road patrol, uh, which is a long time, but 
I'm there now, and I uh, actually put in to work for Eternal Affairs. Um, not too many people in our on the police force put in to work for Eternal Affairs because uh, as soon as you do, uh, you don't get the calls anymore. You call, go to lunch. Uh, people bypass you. So you're pretty much on an island once you go into the Eternal Affairs. So to give you a breakdown of our police department and how it's set up, it's run by, as you know, Chief Simonelli. Approximately 724 sworn members, 200 non-sworn, they're, they're support staff, like technicians, and they work uh, in records unit, secretarial staff, that type of stuff. And we're assigned directly uh, to the office of the chief, and I report directly to the chief himself. There's one commanding officer, and that would be me. There's six investigative sergeants, and we also have two stenographers. I'm hoping to get the, the second one in there from a vacated position. We're running behind on our case timelines. It's very important that we have timely investigations. We want them to move forward as quickly as possible, but still we're going to be very thorough in how we do these things. But things are backed up because we only have one stenographer. When people come in for statements, they're actually taking a sworn statement, and that's what we have our stenographers for. So obviously if we're cut in half, that inhibits our ability to be able to have them. So the objectives, these are things that we're looking for here today. Now, those, these are the <clears throat> official reasons. The basic reason is we want you to understand our process and what we do. And there, there are some times when we cannot divulge what we're doing or why we're doing it. And that's because there are certain laws enacted that we need to follow, certain poli police procedures that we need to follow, investigative procedures. But it's important that you understand why, because this helps everyone understand the transparency of what we do. So what we're going to cover today is what are the responsibilities of the professional standards section? We want to explain about the complaint intake process. We're going to have some handouts, which include the actual complaint form and what we give to our, the folks that come in and make a complaint. We're also going to help uh, discuss our investigative procedures so that you can understand the different steps that we take. And just to give you an idea, we take each and every complaint seriously. We take it serious enough where we do the same investigative steps as there are for homicides and other major felonies. So all those things that you're doing around those major cases, we're doing with ours. Regardless if it's a minor procedure complaint or something more serious like force. So we, we have the same investigative process. And then we're going to discuss the different findings that we have. <coughs> and the civilian review board process and functions. I understand that folks from the CRB, Frank Liberty, have already been here. We're just going to touch on that and, and explain how we work together. We both advocate for the process. Neither one of us advocate for the police officer or for any of the citizens. And it's important for you to recognize also, we do not advocate for, this, for the police officers. We're not here to justify what the officer did. We're here to put together investigative facts. And that's what professional standards section does. We also have what's called IA Pro, which is an early warning case tracking system. It's uh, our discipline records are kept on a computerized system. <coughs> this is the mission statement. I'm not going to read it, but
Is what I talk, touched on uh, basically before is that we are here to preserve the integrity of the department. It, it, it may sound corny, but I look at our roles, we are the guardians of integrity. When you see that, that horrific incident that happened down around Charleston, the reason why we do our job the way that we do is that if one police officer does something bad, and in this case criminal, it makes us all look bad. And we take that personally. So what we're here to do is maintain the integrity of the department. And to fill this, we do three main things. Timely, fair, and thorough investigations. For our general orders, this is what we are tasked to do um, for the department. Investigate complaints, investigate civil claims. We don't actually investigate civil claims. We'll get information and give it to our law department when it comes through. So if there's reports about it, we'll hand it over to the, uh, our, law, our law, city law department so they can uh, actually handle it. Uh, do fleet accidents, pursuits, we keep track of them. If officer gets three and three avoidable accidents in three years, that means he's at fault. There's discipline behind that. And discipline can go anywhere from uh, a letter of reprimand in his file to days off or suspension. And we're pretty much a, a clearinghouse for all information. Or if the department doesn't know what to do with uh, something that uh, form information, they give it to us and we store we store it in our database. So for whatever reason, anything that it's it may not even seem like it's part of our department, our question may come in, it's almost automatically filled to us or someone calls us and we do our best to try to answer the question. And we get calls from citizens outside. <coughs> Uh, the city, Fairport, um, asking, can we investigate, investigate a department? And of course we can't, but you know, if they're not getting the satisfaction in Brighton, I got a call from Brighton uh, citizen, and uh, she thought her complaint wasn't being taken seriously, and she called us, and I said, well, we can't. You have, you know, have a jurisdiction over Brighton, you may want to try the state police or the attorney general, the state attorney general. But we feel questions like that. Um, we may maintain discipline and award records for all officers, and we review Brady Giglio material. The federal government may call and ask for information. If an officer has to uh, testify in the federal court, they will know if there's going to be any problems with that officer as far as truthfulness or that the defense may be able to pick up, pick up on. So they'll call our office and ask you know, for the information, and we give it to them. Um, we take we do any investigation as directed by the chief. Uh, anything media worthy, um, <coughs> or, or the, you know, the mayor may ask the chief for something. He'll call the office, and it may not be the case. It may not be a formal complaint at that time, but he'll he'll send us out and start doing the legwork, getting video, getting. Um, hey, boy, Chuck. Yes, just in, just before it disappears. So we, he'll have us go out and start that process. So we have it. Because a lot of uh, video is like 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the city cameras is 30 days and it's lost. So if a complainant comes in is, and, if, and she's, if they're not <coughs> willing to file a complaint that day and it's nearing that 30 days, even on our own, we'll go out and secure that video so we have it. So if that person does decide to come back in after like 60 days later, we have that video and it's no, no longer gone and long-term disability. Officers that are hurt and injured, um, we keep track of that. Just a, I mean, basically our database keeps track of everything. Um, admin complaints, people coming in just asking, asking for information, we fill those. Or they may call us and say, you know, they have a complaint over the phone and they'll say they're coming in, but they don't come in. We'll take their information and the officer they complained about and just make an electronic entry so we have it. There's no formal complaint, but it's in our database, and we have it. So the complaint intake, the first thing, the different types of ways to make a complaint. You can walk can into our that, office. Can I, excuse me for a second. Can we pass out the handout so people can follow? Yep, and that's what we're going to do okay. is right through there. We've got different points we're going to do that. Thank you. So there's different ways for uh, people to make the complaints. You can go to the patrol divisions that are sections. Just call 911, ask to talk to a supervisor. Center for Dispute Settlement is also another complaint intake. 
the NSC offices, as well as the City of Rochester websites, Office of Public Integrity, and as well as Twitter. Oh. Internal, you can also call the Office of the Chief, also the Office of the Mayor, and other uh, department members. Okay, just um, with the department members, if you uh, go, up, go to a sergeant and um, you tell the sergeant that you know that person he want he wants to file a formal complaint um, by our general orders, they have to fill out the personnel complaint, and they'll gather um, some of the information, and then they'll forward it to us. But if a, if a citizen tells the sergeant they want to them to take the formal complaint to start the process, by our general orders, they have to take it. We'll take over it. They'll forward everything to us. Um, sometimes, you know, we may miss communications. They'll send, they'll tell them, well, go to PSS. You know, we're in the process of telling the sergeants, for our general orders, you know, if they tell you directly that you want, they want them, you to take the um, form of complaint, and you take it. If you know, if they say, "Well, I'm, I'm going to go to PSS," then that's fine. That's on their own. But if they're directing you that take that rep that complaint, you are to take it, and then we'll follow up on it. What I'm handing around now are what's called frequently asked questions, and I just handed around the actual complaint form. That's for a formal complaint. You don't need to go through a whole formal complaint process if you feel that something went wrong during your stop or anything like that. You can just talk to a sergeant, and that sergeant or whoever the supervisor is will explain exactly what happened with that incident. And then if you're not satisfied with that, then you're certainly welcome to come to us, and we'll look into it even further. But it's, um, I, I don't want you to get the feeling that there has to be some sort of formal process to do this. Anytime that you have a question about police operations or procedures, we welcome you. <coughs> We welcome you to interact with our sergeants and our lieutenants out there and just ask, hey, what happened? Why, why are these guys stopping me? Why did they do what they did? A lot of times it's like, well, why did they have their guns out? So the hey, supervisors will, will uh, gladly talk to you about that. And sometimes and all you got to do is just call 911 and ask to speak to a supervisor about the incident. You want to wait till the end for questions, right? I look yeah. at the question now about what we just talked about. I just have to say, I'm thinking about um, an eviction last week. Uh, 15 police cars showed up for one eviction. Crime seemed to take this pet was put around the property. And so I wonder if I, as a citizen, could make a formal complaint when it doesn't really concern me. What? We need the co actual complainant. To make the complaint, like for lots of times, you have uh, grown children and the parent wants mm -hmm. to make the complaint for the 25-year-old. We need that person to actually come in, and uh, this way, because it's called direct information. As an attorney, I'm sure that you're aware of that, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what we need to do is have that direct information. Yes. Um, I just found out on Sunday um, a land or owner is, was having his which was done by a group of um, white contractors. Um, the police was riding by in the neighborhood. They went and asked the, the kid to come outside, and they said in front of the people that were preparing the porch, taking care of the porch, if this kid does anything or says anything in any way <clears throat> to you guys out there, let us know. We'll take care. Now, to me, that is a little. First of all, that individual. I know who the kid is. I talked to him Sunday. The police know who he is. So how is he going? They already then said if he does something to you, let us know. They already they already done put out their antennas for. Him. So do you see what I'm saying? This this is a fearful thing here. Okay. What, and, I, what and, I suggest? And I, what, what you're oh, saying yeah. sounds it, it sounds great, but we don't live in that kind of society here in Rochester. Okay. What our goal here today 
is to explain our complaint process and how we do things. Okay. Going into specific matters like this, I, I obviously don't have all the information. I wasn't there in a room about that. But I'd suggest that if you run across something like that, call up 911, ask to speak to a supervisor, especially if you already know who the officer is, and this way they can hook you up with the right supervisor. 911 or 311? 911. Okay. And, and they'll fill that out right to the supervisor. And you're more than welcome to talk to the supervisor and, and ask those questions. On behalf of that individual. Right. Okay. But well, you can't make a complaint on behalf of that individual. But on I can of the inquire. Exactly. Okay. You, you can you. talk to the to the uh, the sergeant about it. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I think it might be helpful. I, I should say I'm also the co-chair of Irvin Stewart of the coalition. It might be helpful because I want to make sure you have time to get through your presentation um, to hold questions to the end. Is that okay yes, yes. for the agenda? So if everyone, if you have a question, just um, keep it in your right. mind so we make sure you have enough time to do your presentation. Thank you. Is that okay? Okay. Sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I just know that I know that we can get into We could be here talking all night and we'll be stuck on our facility and <laughs> all day all night. Transparency is vital in whatever we're doing. So if you're ever wondering what what to do about something, just call 911 ask to talk to a supervisor and they'll, they'll field out the call. Understand it may not be appropriate in the middle of a situation where officers and are dealing with a possible volatile situation to go up and start questioning the officers, okay? What I'm suggesting is call 911, ask to talk to a supervisor, and we'll be glad to help you. Okay. Well, we're located at 492 Loud Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, you know Loud and Myrtle, mm -hmm. the old net office, that's where we are. It's an old building. <laughs> not, the, not the best place to be, especially inducive to taking complaints. Uh, we've actually had people that are worried about coming down to that area, area of the neighborhood. Um, but you have a waiting area, sonographer's workstation. Um, this is our interview room. It's uh, kind of small. <laughs> you know, we're trying to get better, better our places. These are our, office, well, our, our little stations, cubicles. <laughs> um, actually, the one in the foreground was my, my cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> so. Was it tidy? <laughs> yeah, well, a little messy. Nobody's going to accuse you of living high in the high. Huh. Uh, I'm going to take this one. Yeah, during our investigative procedures, I just we gave you the complaint form. We're also going to uh, have people sign a medical release form if they're claiming any injuries. We're going to take photographs of the injuries. We're going to look at all the reports. Photographs will also include part of a neighborhood check, as well as uh, securing any evidence, locating witnesses, and that would include any video and then we would start interviewing all the people involved there. We look at the whole picture of the incident. So um, let's say that there's a, a video showing a six, seven second clip, even 10 second clip of what happened. What we would do is we would look at before, during, and after. We would look at the whole picture. And that's why we would look at witnesses to develop exactly a clear picture of everything that happened there. We also hand out surveys to the folks coming in because we, we constantly reevaluate our process. And this really helps to be able to do that in just getting direct information from the folks who interact with us. We want to know how can we do things better. And that's very important to us. If you look at the investigative steps in a citizen, com citizen complaint, the form I gave you, these lists are uh, findings that are possible on any case or complaint that comes in. Um, at the end, we'll give you the percentage of what we found for it was last year. Right. Um, for each uh, finding, uh, sustained uh, a sustained finding means that the uh, person comes in and says, the "Officer did this to me," and we go through, we investigate, and we find that yes, the officer did commit that act, and 
and uh, you know, it's either misjudgment or misconduct. misconduct. And then the chief uh, comes up with the uh, penalty recommendation. I mean, uh, his uh, immediate supervisors, the lieutenant captain, commander, the uh, deputy chief of operation weighs, on, weighs in on the findings and the pen penalty recommendation. But the chief has the ultimate say and uh, what the penalty will be. Unprovable. First of all, to, to, I want you to understand how we arrive at these things. What we do in professional standards is we put together the investigative facts and we'll have a recommendation for each allegation. So one complaint may contain several allegations. Uh, the officer was rude to me, the officer punched me, uh, the officer gave me a ticket for no reason. So those are three different allegations that we would look at. And we look at, we recommend those findings that, we, that you have in front of you based upon the information at hand. And we use what's called a preponderance of evidence. And when we look at this information, in court, for example, a police officer's word holds more than a citizen. So let's say everybody ever got a traffic ticket and the officer mm -hmm. said, well, he was going uh, 10 miles over the speed limit, and uh, you was the guy saying, well, I didn't go 10 miles over speed. The judge takes the officer's word. And what we do is citizen's word has the same weight as a police officer. And a police officer's word has the same weight as a citizen. So let's say, for example, we're looking at a use of force in the the complainant said, well, the officer punched me, and the officer says, well, he didn't punch me. We still look at all the investigative facts. As far as we're concerned, that, that, that uh, is equal weight on there. So no word of any one person is taken above another. What we do look at is if we could find independent witnesses who are neither on the police side or neither on that, that other person's side. Independent witnesses we look at. And then we look at any other physical evidence to come up with these things. Next thing that we have there is unprovable. That's what the majority of our cases have. And lots of times it, it's involved because there's just not enough evidence to say whether the allegation happened or not. Okay, let's why well, The officers swore at me. And it's just the officer and that person. Well, there, there's not really enough evidence to either refute or support the allegation. So that's where we go with unprovable. Unfounded means that uh, the incident didn't occur, or it could have been the officer. You may have a uh, person comes in and says, yes, this officer did swear at me. We go and look at the time books, and that officer wasn't working that day. And we go check ACD, we'll check you know, everything else, and he wasn't working that day. So obviously it wasn't that officer, but it may have been somebody else. So now we'll look and see who, else, who it could have been. So we wouldn't just stop at, okay, yes, that officer is unfounded, but we'll look and see, okay, this mistaken identification, who was working that day, that they may have been involved. So unfounded means the officer couldn't have done it for whatever reason, he wasn't present. You know, he wasn't off or someone else. Exonerated is if the actions were justified, lawful, and proper by the officer. Say somebody's complaining that uh, uh, the officer gave me a traffic ticket and we have video that substantiates what the officer was saying. So that something like that would be exonerated. Office investigations are those investigations where the complainant will come in, make a signed complaint, but then <coughs> they won't cooperate with us further. They won't provide a statement, provide any other information. We'll try several different avenues to contact them to include certified letters, phone calls, try to reach out to them any way that we can. And if, if they just refuse to cooperate, then we have to close it out. But before we do that, we look at the entire incident to see what investigative facts we can garner. But we can't gather all the facts if we can't get the information. Now understand, um, this right here starts the process. And on the back, there's the little initial summary that is handwritten that, ops, that uh, the star, our sergeant may write down. That's only a synopsis of what happened. We require a stenographic statement, and what that does is it, it puts totally into your, your words with our stenographer what you said. So we can go back over and over and check for uh, extra witnesses, extra evidence. With us just initiating handwritten, 
it's, you know, it's just going to be short. It's not going to be <coughs> extensive. So that's why we require the cinegraphic statement. It spells out everything um, in your, your own words what's said. And it's longer. Usually there's like 18 pages. So you can see from 18 pages to what a sergeant may have just, what he got, may have garnered, it's not going to cut it. You know, the 18 pages, it's all in your words. And it's a lot more extensive that we can go on. And if we put down what you say, it's, you know, I may not get the right uh, crux of what's going on, but with your stenographic statement, it should, it should carry it should carry a lot more weight to what you said than or what I'm trying to, you know, for what I'm, what I'm trying to think you may have said. What I just handed out is what's called the uh, investigation flow chart. So it has to do with how the complaint starts. So there's two different places on, on the left, you'll notice Center for Dispute, and on the right, Professional Standards. So those are our two main uh, complaint intake areas where we're doing the formal complaint. <coughs> Once again, you can question anything that you want. We ask that you call 911, <coughs> ask to talk to a supervisor. So you don't have to go through this whole process to do that. And also, the complaints need to be made directly by that person. But if you have a question about like you had there, or something else having somebody else, just call 911 and ask to talk to that person's supervisor. So then what we just discussed now is the next step of that process is that intake. And then uh, you'll see what we do next is the interview, and it goes all the way down the line there. So as you can see, it's a rather thorough process that we go through on there. We get incident review. Incident reviews are those cases where we um, will look at uh, what happened during the whole incident and that if we are able to determine that there were no violations occurred, uh, th then we would close it out as what's called an incident review. So let's, for example, if um, somebody's saying, well, the, the officer talked to me and, you know, the way that he stood, it, it made me feel intimidated and fearful. So then we'll talk with other people to make sure that, you know, how, how was the officer standing and, did, you know, was he like tapping his hand with his nightstick or something or what exactly is he doing? If we find out that there's, that everything was done appropriately, <coughs> that's how we would close something out like that out as an incident review. Okay. And then here we just talked about each one, sustained. We talked about exonerated. And then is but Keep in mind that each one of these incidents are still housed in our disciplinary process. So let, let's say, for example, and we'll look at these cases, even if something is found um, to be an incident review or we're looking at something that's unprovable, but yet now we're getting four or five of these unprovables, and we'll start, so we'll look at the officers. And, hey, what's, what's going on? Something is going on. Maybe we couldn't prove these things, but we're, certain, we're seeing a certain level of where we want to have that supervisor role. It takes three complaints. If we get three different complaints, even if they're they're found to be unprovable, we're still going to have the, the officer's supervisor sit down with the officer and find out exactly what's going on with these things. So we're still looking at them as part of our early intervention system. And this is part of our record keeping process. This is all IE Pro. And it's a computer based Internal Affairs Investigative Management System there. <coughs> Provides an early warning and investigative tracking process. So what's nice about that is that if, if we look at, this, let's say an officer is involved in an accident, he's also involved in a complaint, and he's involved in a civil suit, then these, these things will start, start to trigger tra flags where we send it to the commanding officer of that section, and then it's brought down to the next level, which would be the lieutenant, and then the sergeant, and then they actually have to provide reasonings and information and documentation 
to support whatever their findings are about the officer. So basically, we try to handle situations before they become problems. Try to get ahead of it. Allows for the setting of thresholds relative to officer misconduct, and that's what we just talked about, getting ahead of things before there is a problem. Provide an internal reporting system for quarterly, annual, and administrative reports. We submit our quarterly reports to city council, and our annual reports are on the city's website, and uh, they're, they're available to the public, and they've been on there since 2012. And we just put down the 2014 uh, information on there. Uh, the IA Pro, I mean, it, it's mainly a clearinghouse. It stores a lot of our information. Um, some of the stuff can be shared, but a lot of the stuff for con contract, civil service can't. Uh, you know, officer records, his history, that can't, but uh, unless a judge deems it necessary, he can have that pulled out. But, uh, we, but, but the IA Pro contains disciplinary award records of departmental uh, personnel. Um, also, the uh, early early warning. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's good for us. I mean, so we give the uh, supervising sergeant a heads up. So, you know, this officer starts getting alerts. You know, you may need to sit sit down with him, have a talk, see what's going on in his life. Um, okay. And again, maintain the database of complaints. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be formal complaints. I said admin entry, person call calls. You know, I have this complaint, but he never actually comes, the person never actually comes in to make the formal complaint. But we do keep a record of it, electronic record, that this person did call about a specific officer or a specific incident, and it's in our database. So if somebody called 911? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, not 911. We're not tied into the 911 system. If they call our office, you'll, get, you'll probably get the, uh, our uh, sonographer. And who, depending on who's the intake sergeant for that day, we all take turns for the day, they will talk to that citizen, and that sergeant would automatically enter it. Yes. Um, is this process that you got here for internal affairs, how long has this been implemented? Has it been like five years, ten years in the, IO, the IA Pro process? How long has that been back for tracking officers with this contract? I think it was actually started in 2010. But we've input some records, I think, going back to um, 2004. Yeah, 2004. But now we, officer involved shootings are kept indefinitely. So we, we have hard copies of those. And um, so shootings are the only things that are kept indefinitely. There's a purge dates for everything else. And I think <coughs> we'll, we'll get to the purge dates. I'll continue when you go. So these are the steps uh, in the review process. Once internal affairs comes together with, these are our recommendations, these are the investigative facts. We put them together in a case file. And then that sergeant, who's the supervisor of that officer, will look over all the investigative facts that we have. And then they come to their own conclusion about what are the findings and then what are the penalty recommendations. We are not involved with the penalty recommendation phase. We are just involved with the investigative facts of what we developed. And for us, that adds a good check and balances for us in that we're not involved with that process. We just, these are the facts, you guys do with them as you want. Then the next person to look at it is the person's lieutenant. He also looks at the entire case package. He just doesn't look at our summary. Looks at the entire case package, come up with their own determination, their own ruling about is this sustained, is this exonerated, is this approvable, is this unfounded? They'll look at all those. And then they come up with their own independent evaluation. This is one of the things that I like about our process is because each level of that officer's supervision is looking at this. The next one that looks at that is the captain. Quite often it takes several days to go through one of our packages. They're about the size of uh, white pages of the phone book. And some packages, depending on how many officers are involved and how many allegations, some are of the size of yellow pages. So it takes quite a bit of time for the review process to go through. And each level has gone through there. The next step is that after the captain, it would be the division commander. 
looks at it as well. And well, another thing that I like about it, they keep seeing the same name popping up as well. We can also have internal investigations where there's no complaint. Just to look at it, let's, let's see what's happening here. Let's, call, let's create an audit and see what, what's going on with this officer. Then the next level it looks like that is the deputy chief himself. If there are complaints that are sustained, then the chief will review the case and make the final ruling about the penalty recommendations on there. The Civilian Review Board is also involved with this, anything involving the use of force and anything that might be criminal. So they're part of the investigative review process as well, and they do the same thing, whereas they look at the entire case package that we have. And if they see that something might be missing or they'd like to have something else in there, they'll ask for it and we get, we get it for them. So, well, we'd like to try this and this, great, we do that. And uh, the chief can also order additional information as well. The civilian review board also can say, okay, this person wasn't talked to, maybe you should go talk to them. We'll go out and do that. Uh, same thing with uh, the division, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, if they look and see we missed something, they can go back out and they say, well, I think you missed this, go talk to this person, go see, see if this video is available. Um, The only, the only thing that I guess our office investigate, well, not only thing, but we're tasked to investigate our criminal matters, something that could be criminal or use of force. Uh, courtesy, uh, procedure, not getting a report, it'll come to us, but it's, the investigation is going to be handled out at the division. Um, it's called a farm out, and I'm the farm out coordinator, so if it's force procedure, I'll write up the allegations. And I'll send it out to the division, and they'll, the sergeant or the officer will investigate it. But then it'll go right back up the regular chain to be reviewed. Uh, but it'll come back to me, and I'll look it over, and I'll look and see if there's anything missing, any investigative steps missing. Uh, uh, the sergeant will do a neighborhood check. I will have the sergeant go back out and do a neighborhood check. Um, I may even call, you know, he did a neighborhood check. I may call the, you know, that, on that neighbor, the sergeant come out and talk with you just to make sure it was done. Um, so there's two things, you know. I mean, if, if it's courtesy and procedure, we can also do it, but that's if it's going to cross different platoons. Um, two different officers from different platoons are being alleged to have, you know, in a complaint. Well, it's hard for one sergeant to uh, recommend or investigate another, another sergeant's um, officer. So expediency, we will take care of it. I'm not clear about who is the civilian review board that you had in that chart. Who is it? The Center for Dispute Settlement or is the governing body for the civilian review board. They have the contract with the city of Rochester. And these are trained mediators, and they're, they have... Uh, these are trained people who, who have been trained in our procedures so that they can understand if there's been a procedural violation. And they're also trained in how to review cases. So it's not like we just... So the steps are referral back to the civilian... The, uh, during the... During the there, there's a... Uh, what's called the, re, the review process. The initial review process includes these governing bodies the Civilian Review Board, the Sergeant, the Lieutenant, and the Captain. Then there's an Executive Review process, which includes the Commander, the Deputy Chiefs, and the Chief. So it's dual. I mean, we're, we're sending the review process up through the Division, and we're also sending up the Civilian Review Board at the same time. Okay. So the Civilian Review Board is getting... Because the, the chart doesn't reflect that. So it's going at the same time. They both give their findings. Um, civilian Review Board does not give uh, a penalty recommendation. But they can offer, you know, if they see training issues, um, some of the things that could be done better, they'll offer that. And they'll, you know, we'll submit, it, submit, that, submit that to the chief. This is what they are saying. So it, it also it helps with time expediency as well to have, every, to have the, uh, the entire review process at the same time. Once the lower level review is done, then we can bring it up to the executive review. I saw you first. I don't know if I read that question stage yet. 
Um, we're going to take that at the end. So if you have a question about our slide here, or what, what we just talked no. about? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, 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 I have a question. I'm looking at the, the numbers here, okay, and uh, concerning the complaints over the last couple of years, right? To me, personally, what I see is skewed from what I see and live in my community. These numbers to me seem like they're skewed, and I'll go into that after the process when you guys are done. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So these these are the yes. So this is actually a question about um, the process that you were describing a minute ago, where when you farm out a um, an investigation to one of the other the other units, um, you might, I just want to give a little clarity on that. that if there is um, there are questions about uh, the accuracy of what it, what comes back to you. Mm -hmm. How do you, I mean, it sounds like you're the person who's responsible to look at what comes back from a farm out and, and review it and say, all right, this looks accurate versus I think there might be something missing here or, I mean, how does that work? It, it sounds as though you just have to take your take the word mm -hmm. of the sergeant who, who provided the report. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's like we do it here. We go through, they have to follow the same investigative steps that we've done, that we would do. So when I get it back, I'll look and see that one did all it it was all of the uh, neighbors check was the neighborhood done was video um, looked at I'll look and see if there's other video that may have been out there that the sergeant may not have gotten mm -hmm. so I'll double check to see if there's you know anything missing yes and, and if it, on face it looks that way then it goes up to the review process the uh, lieutenant the captain the uh, commander and, and mind you they're also looking at it too to see if there's anything missing. Um, my biggest thing is to make sure that, you know, all the investigative stuff, anything that could have been missing is missing. I may do a call up and see, okay, did, did the neighbor, was that neighbor checked? You, you, you know, you gave me a number. Um, I'll go and check and make sure that it was followed up. So I'm just checking to make sure all the investigative stuff was done. Um, and that's, that's the extent of my involvement as far as and as far as courtesy or procedure. We have certain pr protocols and procedures that need to be followed. And we recognize that, that there are times when we give them out to the um, divisions that shortcuts may be taken. So we're, we're the um, checks and balances of that process to make sure that everything is taken care of the way that it should be. And we also need to look at it and make sure that everything is thorough and everything is fair and that we've uncovered all the evidence we can. Now these numbers that you see here for each of the different findings are based on the level of evidence that was obtained. Okay. So that's the main thing that we come up with is what was the evidence that we were able to obtain? Did we do our due diligence in finding everything that we could possibly find? Did we look at this store and that video camera? Did we check with this witness here and that witness there? Did we were able to locate any independent witnesses? Because if you notice, most of these are ended up as approved. And the reason why is lots of times there just isn't any other evidence other than, oh, well, this guy said, uh, the complainant said this, and the officer said this, and there's no other independent witness to, to say which way it went. So that's why it's improvable. We're hoping that things like the, the body cams that you're working on will bring another level of evidence into what happened in the incident. And it would, we're hoping that with the body cams, you're going to see approvables go way down. And I think, I mean, just, just video being, just being so prevalent now that more things are going to be get being caught out there. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Go ahead. Just a simple thing. Do you have any other recommendations that could help bring the unprovable numbers down? More, having more evidence. And things like body cams, I think, will help. Push forward. Anything we can help do, because yeah. that if this was a normal investigation, like murder investigation, mm -hmm. there's no way they would accept those numbers. Yes. So what can we do? What do you think needs to be yes. done besides the body cameras that we could work on to bring that number down? Anything? Excellent question. And a lot of times, what we're finding is people aren't willing to talk to us. They're not willing to cooperate with us. They're not willing to provide information. And if we could find independent witnesses. To what happened that really helps us out so that's where it comes to with the integrity of the process with 
helping you folks understand the thoroughness of what we do. And then that builds up the trust within the community where they're willing to talk to us when we're out there on the neighborhood checks and trying to find out what happened. Sergeant Snow mentioned in the beginning, we're pretty much the black sheep of the department. Nobody really wants to hang out with us because we advocate for a fair process. We do not advocate for the officer. And if people can understand that and say, hey, look, a bunch of cops looking at cops, it's like, we are the guardians of integrity. I can tell you right now, I'm a Christian. I work for God. And that's how exactly how I look at it. And you're going to do the job, and you're going to do it right. And you're not going to go out there and embarrass me. North Carolina, that was an embarrassment to me. I take these things personally. And that's how each and every one of my sergeants do. i got to tell you, when we heard about that, a bunch of us were in the office looking at it, and, and I looked around, and everybody's jaw was just... We, it was, we looked at that in disbelief. There's just... No, we had to watch it a couple times to just... What you do. And that, it hurts us all when we see that bad happening. So if, if you could get that word out to, to work with us and tell us what's going on, and especially, you know, what you were talking about, you see something going on wrong with somebody else, you know, I have to talk to that supervisor. Let him explain it. You know what, and, and if that, that supervisor is a boss, if you're not happy with that sergeant's answer, or you think that you're, you're being blown up by it, he's got a lieutenant. And that lieutenant has kept. You know why I wouldn't do it? It's fear. It's fear, yes. Fear. It's fear. It's gonna, is, is it going to be like an unlawful entry thing? Mm -hmm. Because I opened my mouth concerning mm -hmm. the police officer. Mm -hmm. And that is something where, if you ever saw anything like that, that's where, call our office anytime, 428 7131. Okay? I mean, that's, that's what we're here to stop and, and for you for, to earn your trust. In your confidence. Yes, sir. What measures or new measures can be taken to protect people that are willing to offer some information? Mm -hmm. Now, are we that's talking, a, talking that's about very important. Are we talking about protecting from that, officers or from from people, other people? Mm -hmm. From <laughs> reprisals of right. people that have done wrong, police officers, criminals, or whoever mm -hmm. the case is. Right. Uh, the citizenry is not protected against uh, perpetrators, whether it's a policeman or a criminal or gotcha. whoever, whoever, give information that sometimes reprisal against the citizen. Let, let so me, now they don't want to give information because they are not protected. Yes. Understood. So let me give you an example of how we do things. Part of our neighborhood check is, that's why we're in plain clothes. You don't see us in uniforms when we're out there. And part of that is to get rid of that stigma where usually it's if there's a bad encounter, it has to do with somebody in uniform. So the, the, the uh, plain clothes is part of that, and it's also part of the process where people can feel free more to talk to us and let us know what's going on. We also leave our business cards in the doors and in the mailboxes. So let's say somebody doesn't want to talk to a suit because they're worried about what the neighbor's going to think or the officer. We leave that information on a card where they can call our office. Everyone's information is kept confidential, and that's kept confidential by civil rights law and civil service law. And the officers have that same right to the confidentiality, as well as the person making the complaint and any witnesses. So, so let's say we develop an independent witness that goes against the complainant. The last thing we want is the complainant to know what this witness is saying or who that person is. Sorry. I will say this. I mean, when we have a person comes in and we complain about an officer, um, we let them know once the process starts, yes, the officer will know your name. But we have... And I will say this, we haven't had a per another person complaining call in and says the officer has actually gone back and reprised. Because the officer knows that we catch them because we have trackers on the cars. If you go out and you mess with, mess with a, a PSS complaint, there are, there are going to be repercussions. So, we, so I'll say since I've been working, you know, I may have had one person call and said the officer drove by. But the officer would not physically come, and come to your house. I mean, God willing. But... It has never happened when I was working because we give, I give you my name and I tell you, if that officer comes to your house, you give me a call. And we, I mean, I'll be calling the chief and there will be serious repercussions because you would not mess with one of my complaints, you know. And, I mean, I, I would, you know. It, 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 
Driving by out of the ordinary could, could be yes. considered a threat. Yes. Okay, just Especially driving when leering by out the window out of the ordinary. Or right. could, I'm sorry. But, uh, but understand, many times the officers patrol that area. If they're so they in that area, we, by yes, area. yes, we understand that. But, we understand but that. like this, what we talked about earlier is that we take these cases personally. And that's you saw Sergeant Stone getting flustered there because it's like, man, if anybody messes with one of my complaints, we have a body of rules and regulations and general <clears throat> orders that we have to follow. And that's, that's where we base upon our findings if they violated any of those things. And one of those is, is it any type of interference with any of the investigations or what we're doing or how we're doing it, even being out of your patrol area. And like the sergeant said, we have trackers on all the cars to show where they're going and when they're there. So let's say, for example, you know, well, the officer's supposed to be driving by that area anyway. Well, we notice that, geez, you know, he's been there 10, a bunch of times. All right, something's wrong here, and we're going to look into it. Yes, sir. Um, I hear what you're saying, and it's, uh, it sounds great. And I believe you wholeheartedly that you're really trying to change this, right? Uh, the process that happened to me, I went through all this process, okay? I went through this process. I'm like, you know, I'm a veteran. Two tours of combat, Bronze Star and Purple Heart, Army Ranger, okay? Former teacher in this district. I watched one of your officers. Like you say from this, this uh, PSI to track the incidences, savagely beat my wife to come arrest me. My wife was in the hospital. I did everything. This officer still retaliated. I had police officers in front of my house, right? Then he came and put another false thing on me. I went to prison illegally for three years. My case was overturned. I still see the same officer in my neighborhood. I'm a homeowner, a parent a taxpayer, a citizen, and he just smiles. I got away with it. <clears throat> now, two shootings since 2005, one traffic incident, and I found this out through uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act, and I believe you wholeheartedly. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm in the state right now because of illegal incarceration, trying to get, I got my name back, my record was sealed, okay? I just... As a man, the same thing as you are paramilitary, okay, as a police department, I just can't believe a lot of this until I see it actually happen. And I think one of the things we need to have is an independent civilian review board that's, that's totally outside of the police department and we're judged by the people that you post to police. That's the only way it's going to happen. We can go through this and we can have all types of... Uh, improvements in this when we have police officers and I'm not saying all police officers are bad because it's a hard job guy I understand that but when we have police officers police and police officers you're gonna have that that how you say that, that ethos amongst your officers to try to basically keep this under the rug right? so so I'm looking at this I can be I can be I can tell you I'm lying if I'm not angry because I watched this officer come in here and savagely beat my wife. She's hospitalized six months. Then another officer threw a weapon in the back of my head. All because of a complaint. So, what we have here is we have a stalemate. Because most of the people, like this lady said, this man said, and other people, they do not trust our police officers. And that has to be improved because it has to do with training. It starts with the training, how we interact with our people that we're supposed to protect. When I see an officer get out with sap gloves on before he even enter, have any interaction with me and try to speak to me or just automatically come as an antagonist, automatically I'm going to be defensive. And any other citizen that's afraid is going to be defensive. So these are the things that we need to look at. Not only this is great. But I need to see it work because when I, like, like he said, Mr. White said, those numbers, when I said it was skewed, he took the word right out of my mouth. It is. It's just too much that's going on to see these complaints get swept under the rug. Now, this same officer, and I'm not going to say his name, I had the depth of operations tell me he will never come near my house again, and he still does it. He also filed false uh, complaints of me having a weapon. They tore my house apart. I've never had a weapon in my home. I have children. I have a wife. 
You know, I'm capable of using my hands. My background training, you know that. So when he did this, and my case got overturned, they tried to bring him back to the grand jury to testify. He refused to come. Now, if that was any other citizen sitting in this room right here, we're going to jail. That is double standards that we have here. I'm a Howard University graduate, sir. So I'm not an individual that you could think that I'm capable of, of logic and reasoning. And I see this process of being flawed. It's too many complaints coming out here. It's too many things that's going on. And I feel, and that's why I'm working with Reverend Stewart, we need to have an independent process. And, and uh, I applaud your, your reasoning, sir, and I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This isn't the forum to be able to have that type of change. The forum here today mm -hmm. is for us to be able to explain what we have. If you, you want change, the way we do is through the legislative body, through the city council and that avenue. You're not going to be able to change it with us because we have our procedures and protocols that we and, have to adhere to. Let me just finish what I'm out. saying. That's what a citizen As far as we're talking about is the findings that we come up with has to be based upon a certain level of evidence whether we can prove it or not. So we're hoping that things like the body cams and other information that we have brings upon more evidence to come up with a conclusion. If, if you're unhappy with the process, work towards legis legislative that's change. What I'm, change that's the process I'm doing now. Good but luck also, you, too, I, I want to ask, hold on, I want to ask the gentlemen here, yes, are they near the conclusion of the presentation? So that then we can have a Q and A, mm -hmm. a that's the last, period, because we, we we don't want to get off on a no, tangent. I'm sorry, because we want to know about this process. Right. That's why we invited right. you. Mm -hmm. Right. So understand, we're not here to change the process. We were just here to hopefully to be able to help you folks understand what we're doing. You in the back, you had your hand up for a while. So uh, the ten percent of the sustained cases. Um, I look, I've looked through the annual reports that you guys talk about that you put on the website, and there's no mention of those sustained cases there. Are, is there? Yes. Okay. It, we, this is the first time we've had the actual breakdown and, the rubber and asked for. But, but if, hmm. if that's the case, okay, then it goes to the police chief, correct, to discipline these uh, student, uh He these. makes the final ruling on sustained cases, yes. Mm -hmm. But then the, the problem is that if we've talked about transparency is that the citizens don't know how those people are disciplined mm -hmm. or the names of them. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and one of the issues is that they list all the, you know, in the report, there's two pages of all these awards that the officers get, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. That's great. great. But what we need is transparency mm -hmm. in the demotions mm -hmm. and different things when the officers are disciplined. Yes. Because I, I talked to Frank Liberty, this was a, a couple months ago, and he said there were like, 12 cases that um, Police Shepherd had going into when, when it turned over. And then all of a sudden, we don't know, from, from 2012, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those, those 12 cases that were sustained over the last five years, they just were evaporated when, mm -hmm. the, when the new police chief came in. Yes. So um, as far as putting things under the rug, we're not even talking about the, we're talking about the 10% 10 10 that were sustained. We don't see what happens with them. Mm -hmm. okay. And that, that's not well, clear to them. Allow me to answer that for sure, you. Sure, sure. The, the, what happens, police records are considered confidential right. disciplinary records. So we have New York State civil rights law, as well as the civil service law, as well as the bargaining agreement that we have with the Locust Club. So we're, we, we cannot release, we can say an officer was disciplined, we can't say how. Now you mentioned okay. that the, these 12 cases evaporated. They do not evaporate, they're part of that officer's internal record. And that, that includes any time he wants a transfer, a promotion, all that information about the sustained case is in there. Nothing gets evaporated. Those records stay five years until after they retire, unless it's unless there's a thing called command discipline where they allow the officer, just for minor procedural things, can be purged in a year. But we have, we have a regular purging cycle. But those are not, understand, they're not evaporated. And just because we don't list exactly what happened to the officer doesn't mean they evaporate. But let me say we it. can't say what happened. But, but de facto for the for the community and for for the citizens, we have to just take your word that these officers I mean that doesn't happen anywhere else. You know, well, let me say let me just say this. No. The complainant if you know the officer that you know that that made the complaint against you, you get a final letter. If it's sustained, you'll know that it was sustained. But like I said, you, you would have to, this, is, this would have to be changed because we are not, we can't, 
give that up to the CTA. I never got mm -hmm. a letter after everything was done. I actually do, I filed 13 FOILs. When, uh, what, what year? Uh, between 2011 and 2014. Okay, now if you filed a FOIL, that was through the legal department. So I, I suggest that you work with them to find out whatever information there is. I mean, what, what, what year did your incident happen? 2009. 2009? And yeah, that wouldn't even be an IPO. But you said from 2004. Yeah, to, to oh, 2004. Okay. I'm sorry, you're right. Yes. Right. Just a point of clarification. Um, are you saying that when a, um, a case is sustained, a complaint is sustained, that the people who complained don't know the outcome? They do know the outcome. They know that the complaint now was that's, sustained. That's a judgment. They do not know But they know don't the, know what happens they with do not that know judgment? The penalty. No, See, now, I don't understand how that's legal under United States law. That's, 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 no, federal, I'm talking federal law. Federal law. Okay. I, I can tell you about New York State uh, civil Here's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We have a constitutional law. Second Amendment, I think. It's mm -hmm. equal protection before the law. Mm -hmm. Right. And so under that, mm -hmm. um, the complainant would have the right yes. in this system mm -hmm. that, that a complainant in any system <clears throat> would have the right to. So I'm not saying that right. it's your responsibility. I'm just saying that if, if that's the case, mm -hmm. then that's something that we need to follow up. And that may be a case for someone, for someone to take it and fight. Um, the question, the question I've got is: You take a situation like uh, Kerry explained in his case, and now, and this is hypothetical because this was before yours. But what would be the process? Is you've gone through your process, you found you found the case sustained, whatever. And then, in the meantime, he's found in the court of law that they're throwing the case out. Does does anything from that go back onto your file? And so that if you're reviewing that mm -hmm. as part of a history document or something, is is the change in the way the court looked at it, does that affect what's in your file on, on a that, particular that's case? That's part of our investigative it process is. in looking at the whole picture. But this is we'll looking look at, at the it after the fact. Because you completed your investigation. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, unfortunately, he had to spend a couple of years in prison. And, and then it got, and, and then it got <clears throat> alleviated. Does that, does that get changed on your record, too, or does it just stay on his it, record? It wouldn't get changed. I mean, his recourse you probably know is either to sue for for monetary at, um, right. and his recourse would you know to, to get to get that okay. done for uh, wrongful mm -hmm. but but my question like he's saying but I can't but this officer is still allowed to constantly break the law. Okay, even after my incident on Locust Street he was involved in a fatal shooting of a young young Hispanic male. This young man was 17 years old. He got shot, what, eight, nine times? Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's always at the point. Then, again, he's involved in another traffic accident on my, where I live, on Dewey Avenue, where he hit another pedestrian, a child. And he got off. And he's still in our neighborhood. I guess, what, what do you mean by got off? Well, you, you don't he's see him. So you don't, I mean, he's there. I mean, it's okay. like... You, so you it's know, an assumption you're making. It's not an assumption part. because I clearly see this guy. Okay. His shift so works, so he's we, there we, every you day. You don't know if he was disciplined or not. That's right. Lieutenant well, well, Calari, the, the, I, I, think what, I think the, the main issue that is being raised here by Kerry and, and others yeah. uh, is the issue of the fact that we don't see any transparency and I understand the laws and everything yes. that we have to do to deal with that. Yes. But in order, I think, to bridge the gap be relative to public trust mm -hmm. in the community, mm -hmm. with the police, that we have to be able to see glaringly. Mm -hmm. For example, if, 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 if a man or woman commits a crime, we're going to see in the newspapers, you know, how that person was judged. That person got 15 to 20 years mm -hmm. in state prison or federal prison, or et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that in order to restore public trust, that we're going to have to see some type of transparency relative to not just sustained, 
but what happened. I understand where you guys are coming from relative to civil rights law, bargaining agreement, and civil service law, that that's not your purview because you have to obey what's going there. Yes, yes. I, and we understand, understand that. Understand. And we would say advocate for right. you to process the way you would like, you, yeah. you believe it would be fair. And understand, I'm not minimizing what you're well, saying I, at all. I, I, well, <laughs> advocate for mm -hmm. changing the process. This is the process we have, mm -hmm. and it's not something. And this is by our legislative body. Mm -hmm. We we can't change that, mm -hmm. but that's certainly within this group. Mm -hmm. You can certainly advocate but, to change that. But also, too, as a Christian, you see that this is not really transparency. This is more like a cloudy glass of water. Okay. If if right? what we're here to do today Don't is explain right. exactly. <laughs> what we're here. This is what we got. Appreciate that. We, we understand. So if you want to change I, uh, it. Okay. Then go about the I have a question about. Oh, well, if Mike, Mike has a question. Okay. He's had his hand up. <laughs> My question really deals. I'm, I suspect that your team here in Rochester works with other similar groups throughout the state. We we do liaison, liaison connect. Is there any other jurisdiction within New York State? Because I'll keep it within the state, not another state, where there is clearly more transparency. Well, these are state laws, so everyone well, is under I, the same. Well, that's why I, I was asking just about New York State. But if you go look at Albany or Buffalo or Rockland County or any other jurisdiction, I'll call it jurisdiction, uh, but any other force like yours. What may be different, maybe is contractual, because you're going to have different contracts between. Right. So, like this thing in the Rondi you know, yes. that's, you know, that's out in the open, you can see that. Yeah. Well, they gave him permission to be fired. He's not fired yet, so he still has to go through a, a, a process. Right. process. Right. But they put it out there. You know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's see, but, that's yeah. some of the information we need to get to see. Well, what's doable in the short run? What's doable, um, you know, locally? What's doable uh, statewide? So if you have some where would we get that information? I mean. Where would we? Where would you get that information about? Uh, I'll just say it this way: where there's more transparency, there's more information. You, you like if you want to know what exactly happened with the officer, how would you change that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. And, okay. And how does it work in certain New York State jurisdictions? Right. Well, we'll understand. Everyone in New York State is mandated by the same state right. laws, so you would there would need to be a change to the New York State legislative body. So that, that's who you would petition or a case to get those too. change. Get and, what, those and what we do is, you know, you may call down in New York City, not about, you know, what, yes. you know but we'll call how, how do they conduct their investigations. Right. You have some suburb, suburban towns or towns that their right. investigation is done in 30 days. Yes. I mean, we could do 30 days, but yes. you may not get, all right. A full you, thorough. Right, you may not get a full thorough, mm -hmm. and you may, the numbers may even be worse than that because you're going to miss some stuff. Um, my, my office, the, the main thing that we do is, is to gather all the investigative information, all the evidence that we can to come to a determination. And sometimes it takes a while to do that. And I would rather us take longer to make sure we have everything than to shortcut something and then we miss it. I see. You sound better than your predecessor was, was Sergeant Malley. Okay? He was the one that did the so-called investigation. I went in and had the, the cameras and interrogation room, 15 witnesses, neighbors. He set my wife out on the steps after she was bloody, like to patrol. And then the other officers, right, when my other family members came up to say, who did this to her? This officer strutted around on my lawn. I did it. I did it. And the other officers grabbed him, threw him in another squad car, and he drove off while I talked to the sergeant. And the sergeant came in my living room floor and told me to shut the F up. I don't have a foot to stand on. And that's in the complaint. I put it on the internet. Everybody's seen it. So, uh, you certainly this have is, a legal This is very good information go for our follow up well. discussions. If, if you're not happy with how the investigative went, you I'm certainly have that recourse. Because I, I that's do, not something I can change. Well, I understand that. And I know you guys are just the messengers. But I'm just saying, I, I think it's got to be changed on the federal level. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. And they certainly yeah. advocate yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Do you guys have a mechanism so that, I, I mean, Carrie just said Sergeant Malley, and there was another case in 2006 where Malley ordered the assault of a man on Dewey Avenue, mm -hmm. and then... I'm sorry, um, Malley ordered the assault on the yes. man. Yeah, he was yes. an officer at the scene when this guy got beat up and taken into prison, uh, taken into custody. And when that individual, Russell Davis, went down to complain at PSS, mm -hmm. Sergeant Malley was in charge of that investigation mm -hmm. and he was unfounded, was the final conclusion after two years of impressing for mm -hmm. what happened. So I'm wondering if PSS has a mechanism to remove officers, sergeants, from the position of um, overseeing you know, cases where they're directly involved. The, uh, the lieutenant is directly in charge of everything that goes on. So I am responsible, that's what I start out, I am responsible for the professional standards section. Every investigation that the sergeant puts forth, mm -hmm. I look at. I look at all the evidence that they have. I look at their investigative summary. I'm their checks and balances for my sergeants and what they do. If the lieutenant is seeing something deficient in the sergeant, I correct it. And like I said, I, I can't tell you what happened in the past. Right. I can tell you what I, since I've been there, I take these things personally. Okay. I really do. How long have you and been there? And when I look at that, and then I, if I see you know, how many times you brought something in, you end up getting back. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a stickler about details I'm and making sure that we have yes. everything. Right. Yes. And that's how we do that. And I hope I'm that straight. you believe that because it's true. Yeah. I, and so I, what I can say is if we're seeing a sergeant is deficient somewhere, then we will work on, and I've done that myself. I, he wasn't deficient in, in, not, uh, in not being fair. It wasn't, uh, he was missing. He was, this is a very difficult job to do in that you have to look at the investigations differently and that the information that you're coming through is like, some people have like engineer minds. Okay, well, I got A, B, C, then I'm gonna go D. Well, sometimes with our stuff, you gotta go A, D, B, F. Some people aren't capable of doing that with that type of thinking. I mean, how, how long have you been on the? I've been in professional standards section three, three years. I understand, so, you gotta be able to change gears quickly. I mean, we'll, we'll be working on something and then something hits the media the chief calls up, I want it down, but I, I gotta get this done. No, you gotta get the, you gotta build a move, get that, you know. Yeah. So you gotta you gotta build a yeah. move. Yeah. So and, and you also have to worry not have to worry about what other people think about you. Because lots of times we get on the elevator, everybody gets off. <laughs> and we're, we're walking down the hall and everybody else goes on the other. That's telling me you're doing and, your job. And it's it's, it's tough for the culture of police yeah. because we like to band together. Mm -hmm. But they, they know, okay, look at we've got a job to do. And we're going to do yes. it, and we're going to get yes. it done. That's how that is. I'm sorry, I'm too deficient. I, w one other point, like I don't trust you, and I'm going to tell you why. Because okay. if you were doing this job in 2000, when would you come in? I came in uh, uh, April of 2012. April of 2012. So, Benny War was attacked. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. he was thrown on the ground. He was mm -hmm. beat up. We got PSS findings from the following year, 2013, and in it, it's very yeah. tough. It's the facts, mm -hmm. and it states the police narrative right off the bat. The whole, the whole PSS report tells the story from the point of view of the police. It doesn't mm -hmm. advocate for the people that were there witnessing. Yes. The videographer that witnessed him getting beat up and thrown out of the chair was never contacted, as were another, other independent witnesses that were in notice of claim filed four days after the chief said, you know, <laughs> we're going to open an investigation in this mm -hmm. case. And so when I hear you saying we want integrity, you know, we want, um, we're not biased toward the citizens or the police, and you know we're advocates for the process. I, I hear you say that, but the facts, at least in that case, did not pan out that way. And so I'm very frustrated by. I will say this: what you're you saying can't talk about specific cases. There are some things missing out of that because it was slanted one way, and uh, it's hard to say about it. But there are some things that were done that were not listed in there. Okay. But, you know, you know, like I said, we can't. It's it's part of litigation right now. We can't discuss right. it either way. Of course. But I'm not. I'm telling you right now, you don't have the whole story, and that's. All I can say about that. Yes. I have some questions about IA Pro. Okay. Um, the, uh, does that record also things like uh, uh, settlements? Yes. Any so type of if, legal action. So, well, well, no. If if someone files a case against an officer in the department, and they reach a settlement of which part of the settlement is a 
Uh, it, yeah, it closes that the, 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 the person bringing the case cannot talk about it, mm -hmm. and the department, as part of the settlement and the payment, is found to be uh, uh, not guilty. They're, they do not accept any blame for the incident, but they agree to a payment. Yes. Okay. Does it record that in the person's file as well? It does not, because the, the legal part has its own, they have their own computer system. I understand system, that legal, ours is this is what I'm asking about, because they under, I understand legally the department did no wrong, but in some cases did agree to pay, in some cases, millions of dollars, which does imply to the citizens like me that there was something wrong if you agreed to pay millions of dollars. Okay. And the second one is, when does it record when judges throw out or dismiss testimony of an officer? That's part of the investigative process in our case. So that would be part of the, so the actual case package. If, it, if it's finished before the case is done. Sometimes... Well, no, I mean not on that case, but on other cases as well. You say it keeps a file on officers and things, but, um, and what I want to know is, if, for example, a judge in the last five years has thrown out testimony three times, is that something that IA Pro no. would bring to your attention? We wouldn't even we wouldn't have that. If the case, if what the officer is doing, the, I'm sorry, when the sergeant is doing the uh, complaint, if the, if uh, the case, if the criminal case is done, that would be included in the that would be included in IA Pro. But if it, you know, but if the sergeant finishes the complaint before the court case is done, then it's not included because then it's not tracked. It's so, not well, well, what I'm trying to get at is, you say you sometimes use IA Pro to review people who are having problems, and lawyers I know who are pursuing cases against the city um, frequently say they have trouble finding the information from a period back about officers' testimony being thrown out. And what I'm wondering is, is there a way that IA Pro could be used to collect that information so that you can review situations where officers' testimony are frequently being thrown out? What, what we would do is rely on our checks and balances with the Monroe County District Attorney's Office. So let's say you get a prosecutor that's bringing up before, before this case. And then, oh, geez, I got this officer testifying. And each time it, the judge is throwing out his testimony for, for but, whatever reason, they're going to bring it to our attention. Okay. And we can, we can okay. conduct an appeal. I was just trying to find out if that was. It, it is not. not it is not. not. Okay. But understand that that's a legitimate concern. And we would certainly right. And I was just trying to think of things that should be, I think, included in the IA Pro and could help you do your job better. And that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Um, you both of you are police officers? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you've been on the force for how long? Working on um, my 26 years, and you got 22? Over 22. Um, I really appreciated being part of this discussion today. Yes. Thank you. I didn't yes. know about the process, and it, it really is an eye-opener. But it, it makes me just wonder, do the police officers know about the, the watchdog that watches over them in this that's why they go the other way when we. But, but the thing of it is, this 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 is this is the clincher here. For them to know that you all are watchdogs, and for them to be as brazen mm -hmm. as mm. they are, like with this young guy, to be as brazen to stop at a house, tell the kid to come outside if he does something, let us know. Well, to be that brazen. And knowing that's something, if, if I know, it's just like the, the scenario when the cat's away the from my play. play. Some of these officers can care less about them. Right. And I understand, we, can, we can't be everywhere at the same and, time, okay? But having said that, each new sergeant that's promoted mm -hmm. spends a day with my folks uh -huh. in PSS. So they and that know. sergeant understands they're my expectations of that sergeant to work with their people, mm -hmm. to take care of a situation before it becomes a problem, to document mm -hmm. things, and to take care of things. Don't, don't overlook things, don't sweep under the rug. And they're also indoctrinated into what our procedures are about following through on things. Well, so I'm this curious. way, now you've got all the sergeants out there on the same page 
as we are. Well, because they very may well have the firm on investigation looking into it. They're not afraid of that. I mean, you all might be the black, you might, you might be the police and after them, but after you telling me this, I didn't know that. But after them knowing what you all do and then they still get out there and just, you know, the way how they carry on their behavior is with, with, with the public sometimes, cussing and carrying on and the F up and all of this stuff here, come on. We're hoping that as we obtain more evidence, then we'll find those things. Me. Uh, we, we got time for at least Excuse two more questions. Me. We need to conclude yeah. in about minutes. 10 minutes because we have another meeting yes. at 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to prepare for that meeting also. I, I want you to understand, I'm a big fan of the body cams. And each yes. one of those findings yes. that you guys have seen are based upon evidence. Mm -hmm. And the body cam is just another form of yeah, evidence. Mm -hmm. And another form of evidence is people coming forward and talking to us, letting us know what's going on. When we do those neighborhood checks and what's going on, so that we can find out exactly what's happening. Yes? Two quick connected questions. One, you're building on Lyle Avenue. Is it handicapped accessible? And when I say that, I mean it's not a big no step entrance that if I was in a wheelchair, I could get into the building on my own? Yes. yes. Okay. And then connected to that, do what provisions do you have if someone comes in to make a complaint in person and they need either a sign language interpreter or a Spanish or Somali or something interpreter? Right. We actually have a solutions online is what it's called. And uh, we set up a, a time ahead of schedule. And we whatever language uh, that person has, they would bring in a certified interpreter. And they they have sign language too? Yes. I don't know if they do sign language, but, but we, we, do, we would get a certified interpreter for that. Well, I, I apologize. I, I, now I have a follow-up. I'm sorry. So would officers in the field have access to that same thing? To for sign language? To force, let's go with anything. But my, my Actually, officers online have it through 911 system that they can call a, an 800 number and they can actually have a uh, conference call, phone call and they could talk. Okay, now, now let's talk about sign language then, because a the conference call is not going to help very much with that. <laughs> okay. Um, as far as sign language, several officers know sign language, and that they would help there. They'd also have a pad, and they could write things out as well. So we try to make it as convenient two more, two more. as possible. Uh, Dr. Wilkinson, Rajesh had his hand up. Uh, you've got to make it quick. Gotta yeah. Make it quick. 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 Um, does the, C the Civilian Review Board, do they have civilian investigators as well? No, we're, we're the investigative body. So then civilian review, but when it does its review, doesn't do investigation? Right, they review our investigative package, but if they see something they would like more in there, the they outside. can ask for it okay. and we would get it for it. And do the police um, who are being investigated, do they have uh, legal counsel during legal that and, process? Legal uh, and the, uh, the union counsel. Rajiv? One of the complaints I've heard from public defenders is that the process of the stenographer, the process of taking notes and people coming forward and giving information often damns the victim of the police uh, complainer, the complainant, because the, the words and the different things can be used. They have this huge kind of um, documentation where the legal department and the police, the defense of the, uh, the, the, the unions can then take that material and keep on exacting more information to get inconsistencies in that process. So I was wondering, is that, is that information is privy to the, what, the legal defense, right? What we do is when they come in, and if they have a criminal case going, we advise them that anything they say can be turned over. So we, we advise them, talk with your, your lawyer first. But you have up to 18 months to file charges. I mean, I'm sorry, not charges. File a complaint against that officer. So that should be, you know, so you can come back after your... Uh, criminal cases done with, mm -hmm. and then that can't be used after that because mm -hmm. your case is already done. Okay. So, but if you come in, you know, and it's, the complaint is it was forced, we'll, we'll take your, you know pictures of you and put your name in, in our database. So when you do come back, we have everything ready to go. So we let you know the ultimate decision is up to you. If you have uh, criminal charges pending against you, okay. you can still come and talk, give that day. But we give you the warning that once it starts, yeah. Yeah, it, it can be going both both directions. Okay. Yeah, so we said, but so most defense lawyers will tell them wait till after your criminal case, then come back and talk, then file your complaint. Okay. 
then you can use that. Okay. Uh, Bishop, did you have a question? Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Ted? Uh, just curious, um, after, uh, let's hypothetically say something happens and Officer Ron Dewey becomes public knowledge, be a YouTube or whatever, and the chief gets on, the chief and the mayor get on the news and say, we, <laughs> yes. you know, adamantly stand by our officer, they did nothing wrong, this is, uh, you know, they were right in what they did, I think of numerous cases where this has happened. Um, does that impact your investigation when they come out publicly and say something like that? Our, well, they usually they say that after our investigation. No, no, I mean, like, seriously, this happens, like, maybe two or three days after it's broken into the yeah. news cycle. And then, like, oh, I'm like, Caden Blackman, like... Right. No, the, our investigation yeah. is independent about what anyone is saying. The chief does not tell me... I, like I said, I do not work for the chief. No, yeah. I really don't. I work yeah. for God. And I'm, we're going to conduct this investigation, and we're going to get evidence everywhere. And if it turns out, well, Chief, you spoke a little soon, and maybe you shouldn't have said this, I'm going to give him that evidence. We're going to present this case forward. It's up to him to decide. So it's up, it's up to him to decide when he's going to make a determination and what these facts are. And understand, when he's, he's presenting these facts, uh, you know, we may find something later on to change that. And I, I know from personal experience in working with this Chief, Chief Simonelli, he is an honorable man. And if he sees, oh, geez, you know what? I was wrong there, he would look at that again. And I, I know from the fact that I mean, the Inquisition was launched under <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, who, is, who, who, who are you hired by, though? I'm hired by the city of Rochester. OK. That's not that's, No, that's good to know. That's good. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much for telling me. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Very, very thank helpful. You. Very, very helpful. Were you able to conclude the presentation? I, I think so. I said we were just, like I said, advocating for the process we have. Right. And then mm -hmm. if you want changes, the legislative body is the way yes, to go. Sir. Yeah, that's our yeah. Yeah. And that's So thank you so much for the Thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. We appreciate you being here.